Alrighty, as we do, as we, as we typically like to do, we, we like to start off our time in the mornings as we're working through the Word with a framing question. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We're going to be using the same question from, from last week uh, as we look at our passage. How are believers to pursue, to pursue unity with their church members? How are believers to pursue unity with their church members? It's important for us to remember the context of chapter 2 um, and to keep this in mind uh, as another layer um, in the midst of Paul's encouragements and admonitions. That the aim of what we're reading is, is to help and rebuild love and unity and encourage the church. And in that, there is much encouragement for us today. I'm ready to get into it. So if you're taking notes, this is our first point for this morning. Believers pursue unity through God-fearing obedience to His commands. Believers pursue unity through God-fearing obedience to His commands. Believers who are submitting to God's Word and His work within their lives become more holy individually and therefore experience more unity corporately. Amen? And so to preserve this unity that we have as a church, the personal holiness of each member of the church matters. And so this, the call from Scripture that we have today is that we are to join in that work, being enabled by God with a humble attitude and soberness and a, and a clarity in our mind um, to, to follow in this work to grow in Christ-likeness. We'll be picking up in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's start with verse 12. Therefore, whenever we come across therefore, it's, it's typically referring back to as a result of a why of what we've previously covered. And in last week, we covered in this last section about the, the Carmen Christi that Christ came down, he made himself the form of a servant, and be, as a result of that, he was exalted and given the name above every name, which is Lord. And so as a result of the fact, the reality that Christ has been given this, that he is Lord of lords, we are to work our own salvation with fear and trembling. And thankfully, this is something that, as Paul highlights for us here, the Philippians have always done. My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this, this phrase here, work out your own salvation, has, has, has puzzled many because we all know, we're all well aware of Paul's theology and so for, for us, it, this seems like a contradiction. What is Paul saying here? To work out your own salvation? Are you saying to, Paul, are you saying I need to work for my salvation? No. That's not what we're talking about here. This does not mean to work for our salvation or to maybe work up within us our own salvation. That's, that's impossible. The scripture is clear that, that only God is the source of salvation. That is a gift from him. And it's nothing that we can produce within ourselves because prior to God opening up our eyes, to God changing our hearts, we are dead in our trespasses. And as we know, dead men can produce nothing. So what does work our, our salvation mean? One theologian put it this way that I thought was helpful. Working out our salvation means to make sure the influence and implications of salvation permeate the whole of our lives. To make sure the influence and implications of salvation permeate the whole of our lives. And how can salvation permeate the whole of our lives? How does this happen? It is through God-fearing obedience and hard work enabled by the Holy Spirit. God-fearing obedience and hard work enabled by the Holy Spirit. That is how we see the implications and influences of salvation permeate through our lives. If you were with us when we were going through the abstract of principles uh, in our doctrine class in our Sunday school time, uh, you, you might have remembered the deluxe salvation package. And it was this graph that showed the, all of the multifacets components to salvation. So whenever we read the word salvation, it, it, it's a loaded term. There's, there's many facets to it, and we need to rely on the context and the rest of the Scripture to help us inform what is that talking about. Clearly here, what this is stressing 
the obedience it's calling us to is the category of salvation called sanctification. Some of us might be aware of that uh, or, or know what that means, but for those of us who aren't aware of that, uh, sanctification, uh, mean, sanctification is twofold. And the first and primary meaning of this is that to be sanctified is to be set apart, to be set apart. And that does happen once in Christ when we are saved. Through Christ, we are sanctified and set apart as holy ones. However, the second fold of this part, the second category of sanctification, is the process of ongoing growth in personal holiness over time. And we don't ever achieve perfection through sanctification, but we grow more and more into Christ's likeness over time through participation with the Spirit in our acts of faith and God-fearing obedience and hard work over the life of a Christian. Amen. So this aspect of salvation, sanctification, is what is called synergistic, which means there's two agents in here. And I want to highlight this because I want to make sure we get the right order as we're thinking about this. There are two agents involved in this category of sanctification, but the primary agent is God. So I want us to be careful that you don't hear me say that only for you just to work hard in your own strength. That's not how this works. It is always an act of faith through the Holy Spirit when we grow in sanctification. So the primary agent in sanctification is God, and the secondary is us. God uses our, me- God uses our obedience, our faithfulness, as a means by which we can grow in personal holiness. And it's a wonderful, wonderful life. So I want us to be clear here that, that the life of the Christian is a life of hard work through faith to see the fruit of salvation, the growth and the goodness of the Lord permeate through the whole of our lives. It takes work for us to take every thought captive, as it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It takes work for us to say no careless word as Christ commands us in Matthew 12, 36. It takes work to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. It takes work to live a life worthy of the gospel, as we're reminded in Philippians 1:27. It takes work to store up the scripture in your heart as we're called to in in Psalm 119. And it takes work to preserve the unity that we have as a church. So, but how are we to work out this salvation, this admonition, this this gross and sanctification that Paul calls us? Is Is it to work this out with our chin up and our shoulders back? We got this? No. It's clear that this is to be with fear and trembling with fear and trembling. And and in reality, all Christians at all times should be characterized by a fear of God. We should all be characterized by a fear of God. People, when they talk to you, they should know that man, that woman fears God. They fear them more. They, They fear God more than they fear men. And this category, this the fear of God, is not a topic that is brought up often in our day and age, is it? Because in our day and age, this category of having fear or talking about fear is, 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 is looked down upon. And the world hates talking about fear, obviously. However, when we see the fear of God in the Scripture, we see it all over the place. It characterized how Paul was in his ministry to the Corinthians. He didn't come to them with fancy words, but he came to them in fear and in trembling and humility. We read about it earlier this morning when Pastor Joaquin was praying. It characterizes the call that Christ gives to kings, that they are to serve him with fear and rejoice with trembling. Solomon highlights, for this, highlights this for us famously in the Proverbs. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear, fear of the Lord is how this is to happen. And, and this fear and trembling, these words here in the Greek, they're literally phobos and tromos, which mean dread and quaking. So, so we want to get that clear, that clear to us today. It is with a fear. It is with a holy fear, but it's not just like only dread or terror. That's not what we're talking about here. It is holy reverence. And this, this, the motivational force behind this is not fear that, that, that makes you want to run away from God, but it is a love. This is what we call living quorum Deo, living before the face of God. 
And as we see from the examples of Scripture, whenever men come before the face of God, they experience right and appropriate fear. And so when we say quorum day, when we say when we work out our submission with fear and trembling, we, I, want us, I want us to hear and be reminded that we, are, we need to have an acute awareness that as Christians, we are participating and growing with the Spirit, with God. And that is something that we should have a sense of awe and amazement and pause, but also a healthy fear of that. It is not something that we are to take lightly. When we become Christians and we're baptized into the name of the Lord, that means something. Us representing Christ and having his name on us, we can't take that lightly. It is with fear and trembling that we are to then go about our day to serve and to love and to, and to share the gospel, but to do that with a right and appropriate, I now am a representative of the gospel of the Lord. And that is not something I can take lightly. Our bodies, they're called temples of the Holy Spirit. And so is the, is the implication there that we can just do whatever we want with our bodies? No. <clears throat> so with this fear and trembling, it is an acute awareness that God is with us and working in present. So why does Paul call for the church to work out of the salvation with fear and trembling? We, we read on in verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who works in you to both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In the first half of our verse, we see our agency, the call for us to work. And in the second half, we see God's agency. We see how God is present and he is working within us. He is the one that is enabling and allowing us both to will and to work in his ways. And without God first working in us, which is why I highlighted that when I was talking about sanctification, without God first working in us, this is impossible to do as humans. But this is also a, this is also a reality that I want us to be aware of and is appropriate and should bring us a sense of awe that God is really actively working within us. That is not something we should take to granted. And what is he working within us? He's working within us first to will for his good pleasure. Before the Holy Spirit changes our wills, we do have a will. We do have desires, but they are only to sin. They are only to seek our own desires, our selfish ambitions. They're not to seek God's. And we, we, the scriptures gives us plenty of examples of men who do not have God. What do they do? They devise evil continually. But not so for the Christian. I'm in, I was encouraged by Ezekiel and, and reminded that when God changes our wills, he gives us a new spirit which will do what? This new spirit within us will cause us to walk in his statutes and to be careful to obey his rules. Our will is to do his good pleasure. And secondly, he works in us both to will but also to work. So not only is our will, our desires changed, but our actions are changed. We now pray with joy. We now sing with joy. We now serve and love our neighbor with joy for his good pleasure. People who aren't changed, people who God is not working with, they don't do these things. They seek their own will. They seek their own good, not that of their neighbor. And lastly, we do all these things for God's good pleasure. So no longer do we serve our pleasures, but we serve his. And his, good, his pleasures are good and loving. His, good, his, good, his pleasures aren't selfish and intricate, like self-centered. God's pleasures are good. And they're good for us to have and they're good for us to seek, for us to be pleasing, for us to be a pleasing aroma, for our lives to be a pleasing aroma to the Lord is a good thing for us. It's a fulfilled life for us to live in such a way. Well, I have a question for us this morning as we're reflecting and thinking about God's active work in our lives. Do you see the blessing of God's work in your life? Do you see the blessing of God's work in your life? My beloved Brothers and sisters of Disciple Church, do we recognize what a blessing it is for God to be working within our life? Like I say that out loud, and like, do you believe that? God, the creator of the universe, works in your life. And that is not just uh, some, 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 something we read in a book and it's just some, on a page. It is an active reality in the life of Christians. And what that means is that he has chosen to produce goodness in your life. He has chosen to give fruit in your life. 
And the scriptures are so clear about, about, that there is no law against the fruit of the Spirit because they are just pure goodness. Do we recognize the blessing that that is? That he has chosen to give us justice. He has chosen not to give us justice, but to give us mercy, as Brother Taylor reminded us this morning. And as we're reminded every week of the gospel, that we don't get what we deserve, but he has given us mercy. Might we be taking this reality for granted as Christians in this day and age in America who don't experience as much persecution as our brothers and sisters have in the past? Let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, let us make the most of, the, of God's work in our life. Let us make the most of God's work in our life for what he is giving us is true love and true light and true peace, actual goodness that you can feel and see in your homes amongst your families, in your children, amongst your grandchildren. Make the most of what he has given us. And let us not go one more day seeking what, 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 what we can produce, but what God can produce and what God is producing in us. And so as long as we have life, brothers and sisters, let us cherish this blessing that God is working in us. Be encouraged. Amen? Amen. All right, well, moving on to our next point for this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Our first point was believers pursue unity through God-fearing obedience to his commands. And we do that with fear and trembling, with an acute awareness of who God is and that he is working in us, and we are grateful for that. And secondly, that we pursue unity by not grumbling or disputing with fellow church members. We are to pursue unity by not grumbling or disputing with fellow church members. As a church and as individuals, we cannot behave like the world. We cannot allow for this type of attitude, for these things to characterize Christians. Often you hear, primarily just from stats, that Christians are no different when it comes to divorce, when it comes to participation in sin, than then, 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 then the non-believers. How is that possibly true? Of course, we don't believe those stats exactly what they do and kind of what goes into that. But the call from the scripture is clear that we are to live differently than the world. And non-believers need to be able to see those differences. And in how we grumble or in how we dispute is a, is a clear way. How we use our tongues and our actions, what we, what we fight for our rights or what we're willing to let go is a clear way that we show the difference between the church and the world. And in doing so, when we are all on the same page and willing to do this, we preserve our unity and build unity in the church as we just don't seek to grumble with one another or with those outside the church. Picking up in verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. I want to stop there real quick. I remember being part of the crooked and twisted generation. I remember the difficulty and the guilt of sin. Oh, how good it is to be blameless and innocent, to be children of God without blemish because of Christ. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We have a high call here from Brother Paul to do all things with a spirit of peace, not grumbling or disputing, especially with one another, but also in the world. And we're to shine by the power of the gospel as lights in this dark world. And lastly, to do all of this with Christ's return in mind, motivating and encouraging us. Let's pick up in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This is the second do command in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So here Paul is continuing his admonitions and encouragement of how we can build and pursue unity as a church. Do, nothing without, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And why are we to do all things without grumbling or disputing? So that we would be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a twisted and crooked generation. The world grumbles. That's not 
You know, that, that's not some amazing insight. World disputes, but it shouldn't be so with us. And it shouldn't be so amongst us. We should be able to work through all of our, any, like Joaquin said earlier, in terms of uh, disagreements with people who land on different pages in a way that is not slandering, but in a way that is generous and kind and charitable, that's seeking to come to the same page, to resolution, to come into a greater faithfulness of what the Scriptures say and call us to be. We shouldn't be pursuing the, the zero-sum toil of humans. We should pursue the Lord and what He calls us to do. And one thing that I appreciate from what we see here is, and if you guys have been with us for a while, you know we preach through Exodus. And there's a lot of grumbling happening in Exodus. And we preach through several of those chapters. Like, these guys are still grumbling? What is going on? And that who, that's who Paul is highlighting for, for the Philippians here. He is comparing them and contrasting the church today to what we shouldn't do to Israel. And those stories were given for our benefit. We have those for our benefit today. And Paul, we see an example of him using this here. And I want to I wanna show us, a, um, I want to read for us Deuteronomy 32, 5. See, they just, he, Paul is just pulling the exact words from the Song of Moses into our chapter here today. Moses, reflecting on those Israelites who all died in the wilderness for their wickedness and grumbling, he called them that they were no longer children of God because they were blemished and they were a twisted and crooked generation. Paul is making the connection for the Philippians here. He's, I'm sure he's pulling him back to the, the many nights he's had with them of working through the Old Testament and seeing the connections to the church and Christ is today. And so the true church, obviously the Israelites that grumbled and died, they were not part of the true church. The true church that entered into the promised land has always been characterized by humility and Christ's likeness. So helpful for us to see that in Paul's admonition here. But as we continue on, Paul reminds us that we have a role in this world. We have a role in this world. Back in verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you, the church, shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We have a role to play as the church in the midst of the twisted and crooked generations we live amongst, and that is to be torchbearers. That is to shine as lights in the dark world. And if you weren't aware, Christ calls his churches lights. We are to be light, like, like we are to be like a city on a hill which cannot be hidden. In Revelation, calls Christ, calls Christ the church's lampstands that he will snuff out, depending on their work as he's judging them. So we are to be light in the world. And that's, that's so clear. And the darker the night is, the brighter the light shines. And this this is the result of the difference between the two being more and more clear. And so when we live dedicated lives, blameless lives, seek to be children of God without blemish, when we strive side by side for the gospel, when we seek to live this way, lives full of love for one another, for our neighbors, when we have one mind, when, when, when everyone they meet when they come to church is humble and generous and kind, our light is shining brighter and brighter and brighter against a dark world that only wants to prioritize itself and its own things. And the more crooked a generation that we live amongst, and, and the reason I say this is because we, we see and we, we read about and, and we throw concern about the, 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 the decay of America and how it's getting worse and worse and worse. There's a, there's a purpose in that. And our light shines brighter and brighter and brighter. And the path to salvation is more and more clear that it is only Christ, that America and all its wealth will never get you salvation, only Christ. And is this light that we have, that we are to be the light of Christians, is that positive thinking? Is that kindness? Is that good works? No, absolutely not. It's the unfettered truth of the gospel. It's the word of life which we have in the scripture, we have in Christ. Verse 16, among whom you shine as lights, holding fast to the word of life. That is how we are to shine our light, holding fast to the word of life. In holding fast, we must cling to the gospel as a church. 
The decay we've seen in the American church is when they have slowly but surely let go of the gospel, when they have allowed it to get watered and watered down more and more and more. But the gospel does not change. There is only one gospel. And we must cling to this gospel, for it has everything that we need, and it is the source of our unity as believers. It is the light that we have here as a church. Paul commands us that we cling to this gospel as lights in the world. Not only must we hold fast to the word of life, but we must also hold forth the word of life in this world. We must hold forth the clear light of the gospel in all its fullness. Because in the fullness of the gospel, we reveal man's greatest, man's greatest need, that he is a sinner. And we don't hold that back from him. And I'm not trying to smash him with that, but I'm trying to appropriately show him that the gospel shows he is a sinner in need of a savior. That is the reality of where he is. So we hold forth the light of the gospel. And the scriptures are clear that the light of the gospel, the true gospel, is the only way to salvation. And in us, in us holding that forth, we make that clear. Acts 4.12. And there is, no self, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So not only must we hold fast, we must hold that forth. We must be clear. We must shine the light of the gospel. And as we shine the message of the gospel, brothers and sisters, there's a component to us where they, people will look at our lives. They say, huh, is this gospel real? Huh, is this gospel true? And what we need to be, messengers who live with fear and trembling, who live to follow the commands. And what do those commands call us? To Christ-likeness. These two things together, we, we can bring together our obedience through faith because of the gospel and the gospel message itself we bring forth and shine as lights in the midst of this dark world. And so brothers and sisters, as we're thinking about do, doing nothing with grumbling and disputes, we have to be aware of our, our tongues, of our actions, of our tones. We have to be aware of those things. And we have to make sure that we are living lives worthy of the gospel. Our witness is not effective if we are in the same place the sinners are drinking the same amount of beer. You know, and we're, and we're living debaucherous lives. And we say one thing, but on social media, man, I got opinions. You know, we, we, can't, we, can't, we need to live man, uh, lives manner worthy of the gospel. Does Christ need us to be perfect to share his gospel? No. It does. But in the reality of how these things work out, that is one, that is one way we show the power and the goodness of the gospel. Like I was mentioning earlier, I was once twisted and crooked. All of us here are twisted and crooked without the gospel. And Jesus didn't break those branches like some of them will be broken and thrown to the fire. He made straight our branch. Grateful for that. Grateful for that. <clears throat> Lastly, in verse 17 here, Paul's final encouragement as, he, as he's reminding the church to do all things without grumbling he also appeals to the final day when our works will be judged. Verse 17. Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, when he comes back to judge our work, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul here is calling to the Philippians, don't let me down. Make me proud in that day when Christ is with us that, that, and prove to me that I did not labor in vain, that my tears, that my sacrifice, that my beatings, that... My sufferings were not in vain. So he, he encourages the Philippian church, and we should be encouraged today to continue, to continue their witness and to spread the gospel forth. I've got another question for us as we consider grumbling, disputing, living a life worthy of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, are you falling into a spirit of grumbling or disputing? That may, might be what characterizes where you're at right now. I'll be honest, these last couple of weeks since we've had Juju, been a lot, lot of holding the tongue and working really hard and, and not my own expectations. It's been, a, it's been really hard. And I've shared with some of you, and I'm thankful for your prayers to give you more grace in this season and time. 
So brothers and sisters, may we see the shortcoming of this type of behavior. Would we see that it's not fitting for a Christian to think and to behave and act in these ways? And may we remember that we have no reason to grumble. We have no reason to dispute. Why? We've already covered. God is working within you. God is with you. Not only that, death has lots its sting. We have no more great enemy. Our great enemy has been conquered. And the death of Christ on the cross is victory for us. Amen. And not only that, all the promises of the Scripture, they're secured, not in my own works, not in my own perfection, but in the beautiful Trinity. Amen. So brothers, why are we grumbling? Sisters, why might you be disputing? Let us see the shortcomings of that, of that, of, of that behavior and let us do away with it. But if, it's, if that's where you're at and that's where I've had to work through, let me encourage you, brothers and sisters. Let's take a step back. Let's loosen the grip. That's what happens in my life. I always have grip on my expectations and what I want. Let's loosen the grip of whatever we might be having, that, that thing is going on in our life and ask the Lord for forgiveness in the specific matter. And do it no more. Seek to do it no more in faith. And, but after, after that, what else can we do? Let us set our mind on Christ. Let us be reminded about what we've covered today and the previous weeks, the example that we have in Christ. And the beauty, the, the best thing about the Lord, about, one of the best things about the Lord is that he never grumbled or disputed. He perfectly followed the law. He, he never had any other gods before him. I'll be real, whenever I grumble or dispute, it's because I have other gods before the Lord. I have idolatry in my heart, but, but the Lord, but Jesus, he didn't do that. He never did that. So he never had a reason to grumble or dispute. His heart and his food was always to do the will of the Father. What would it look like if we lived like that? My food is to do the will of my Father in heaven. Amen. So brothers and sisters, we can have this mind too, as Paul has already promised us in, in Philippians 2. We can have this mind which is ours in Christ. Our first point for this morning was that we are to pursue unity through god finger obedience. And our second point was to not grumble with one another or the world. And our last point for this morning, if you're taking notes, is for us to pursue unity by living with our future hope always in mind. Pursue unity by living with our future hope always in mind. It is the future hope that we have in Christ the new heavens and the new earth, that we will judge with him, that we will rule with him, and that our bodies of flesh will be done and we'll have new bodies with spiritual flesh. I don't know what we'll look like, but they'll be amazing. I just know that. <laughs> and so we, because of that, because of this, the, the promises we have in Christ, we don't need to look at, at, at death with fear, but we can rejoice. And we can do all things without grumbling because one day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, and we will be with them rejoicing. So let's see how, uh, how this is true in our final passage for this morning. We can pursue unity by living with our future hope always in mind. Verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Even with, the, tr even with the, th the threat of death and martyrdom, Paul is rejoicing. And he's rejoicing because of what we just covered, what he just wrote, that Christ is the Lord of lords, that God is working within us, that, we have, that in the day of Christ we will rejoice at his ministry. He has this future hope in his mind. And again here, Paul is connecting to some Old Testament imagery. This cup being poured out on the sacrificial offering, this is what we would have seen every day at the temple, morning and evening. A cup of, a cup of wine poured over the sacrificial lamb to be, to be burned in it, made for a pleasing aroma before the Lord. This is what Paul sees his life as a sacrifice. Please, Pour me out, Lord. Pour me out, for it is better to be with you. Pour me out, Lord. I want to be a pleasing aroma. And this is the example he sets for the Philippians church. Even if this were to happen to me, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 
Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Brothers and sisters, this is a wonderful example that we have here that Paul shows us in verse 17. That in light of being potentially killed for the faith of the Philippians, he rejoices and is glad. And then calls us to rejoice and be glad as well. So let us not spin our, 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 our wheels in folly, but let us think rightly with the gospel in mind. Let us think rightly with the example of Christ in mind. Let us think rightly with his return in mind. Let us remember that we've already won, that we win. Let that go and encourage you and lift your sails that whatever trials, whatever things we experience today, slight and momentary, and that our future is secure and that we have already won. So let us finish this race like Paul, rejoicing to the end, glad to the end. Amen? Brothers and sisters, with all of this, I want us to be reminded that Paul is sharing and giving all of this so that we can keep our unity as a church. That when we experience trials and persecutions, to not use that as opportunities to dispute or to grumble or to, or to you know, oh man, my comfort is now being affected. But to turn to the Lord and to rejoice in what he has given us and to seek to serve and to love one another in this. So let us go today with gladness and rejoicing, the example we have in Christ, the admonition from our brother Paul, knowing that we've already won and that we win. And we'll continue to do so. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us in Christ, that you have blessed us with salvation, that you have allowed us to be lights, that you have turned us on, that you have opened our eyes. Lord, you have given us a gospel and called us to hold fast to this gospel and to hold it forth to those who are needed. Lord, may we be bold. May we not fear anything. May we fear not only the one who can destroy our bodies, Lord, but may we fear the one who can destroy both our soul and body in hell. Lord, with a reverent attitude, a soberness, let us work hard to grow in Christ-likeness. Lord, because it is with that and with the gospel sharing, Father, we can be effective in our witness, effective in our worship. Help us, Lord, to live that way. Lord, I pray that our brothers and sisters here will be encouraged by the gospel. We will be encouraged to rejoice and to be glad. We have much, much to be encouraged. We have much, much to be glad in Christ. Lord, you have given us every spiritual blessing. What more can we need? May we keep our minds on the future reality we have with you, that we will be raised in a spiritual flesh and that we will be with you for eternity and that what we experience today is light and momentary. Lord, help us to be bold for you, for your gospel, with your word. And Lord, may we look to Christ for all of our need. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.